I would like to welcome everybody to the 5,564th meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Rotary One is now in session. And as always, we start our meetings off with our thought for the day. And it is my honor to welcome to the Zoom stage, Ruth Ann Watkins. Ruth, the floor is yours. It's a surprise to no one that the pandemic has exposed the wide ranging negative effects of social injustice and discrimination. Being different because of skin color, country of origin, faith, or different ability is a damaging burden on the individual and a loss of greater potential for all aspects of a better world. Today, we will learn about a unique program that combats discrimination against people who are autistic by focusing on each person's unique abilities. As Rotarians, we constantly work to improve living conditions and provide justice and opportunity for people who are disadvantaged because of a variety of poor living conditions and dis systemic discrimination. As individuals and Rotarians, let us remember the following. I think most of you are familiar with this quote, quote, walk a mile in my shoes, see, what I see, hear what I hear, feel what I feel, then maybe you'll understand why I do what I do. Till then, don't judge me, unquote. That's the thought of the day. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, very uh, sobering and, and poignant words, and I think words for all of us to remember as Rotarians in how we respect and treat others and how we help others and make sure certainly that all feel included. So thank you very much. Welcome. Um, we have a, uh, a couple of announcements here uh, at the top of the program. On Thursday, we have our next joint meeting as part of the Rotary First Five Collaborative. Wow. Uh, this will be a great meeting. Uh, we expect uh, over 100 participants, maybe as many as, as 200 from uh, the first five clubs ever in the history of Rotary. So that's not only Chicago, of course, number one, but San Francisco, Oakland, Seattle, and LA. As those who uh, have been following along know, we've been working together now for about a year, did joint service projects, have had some past meetings. Uh, our speaker will be the Rotary International President-elect Shekhar Mehta, talking about the newest area of service, and that's the environment. Uh, so please join if you can. Um, I would, uh, and that's Thursday at 11 a.m. Central. And then also, uh, I would like to just uh, do a shout out uh, on behalf of uh, National Volunteer Week. Uh, just really want to thank uh, all of our uh, committees that are constantly doing work on behalf of this club. Uh, they're really sort of the unsung heroes who are getting all of the work done for this club. Uh, thank you so much. And then as well as all of our members who step up and volunteer for hands-on service and have been volunteering for hands-on service throughout the Rotary year, uh, despite the pandemic. Uh, and I know that uh, some of the virtual opportunities we've provided uh, have, have given those opportunities to people from a, across the club to be able to participate as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our committee members and volunteers. Uh, and speaking of our important service work and our important uh, volunteer work, uh, I wanna give uh, a quick announcement about our Job One program. Our Job One program, of course, has uh, is one of our signature programs that's been around for a very long time. This is the program uh, which allows us to provide job skills training to Chicago high school students. And then with that training, with that screening, we match them with paid internships across the city of Chicago. We've never had a job one employer that at the end of the day was not 
totally thrilled with the intern that they had uh, at, uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, so you're not just doing something good for the city, providing jobs, but as an employer, uh, you are also getting actual work, actual help for the summer. Uh, we had three times as many applicants this year as we normally get, which is fantastic on one hand, but it also means that uh, we need a lot more employers. So if you or your firm are uh, uh, in the in the you know looking for uh, employees, looking for interns for the summer, we're really talking about a minimum of twenty hours a week at Chicago minimum wage uh, across eight weeks. So it's it's really about twenty four hundred dollars to support an intern for the summer. So I know we have some some guests on today. Uh, I don't know if uh, SAP has offices in Chicago that might look to hire an intern, um, but that's uh, but that's something that's a very important signature project for us. Uh, so feel free to to reach out to the club, uh, or Tamara has also put the link in the chat box. And I do want to give a shout out as well to Kay Fleischer and Timo Raybach, uh, who have helped to fund uh, uh, an intern for a nonprofit, for PAWS, the nonprofit that helps animals. Because the other way we can get jobs is through nonprofits, but that requires us to help subsidize uh, those interns. So you can also support an intern that way. Okay, now with that, I wanna move us on to our program. Uh, and uh, with that, I am going to pass the floor over to our esteemed, Programs Co-Chair, Mr. David Hirsch. David, the floor is yours. Eric, thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce my friend, Jose Velasco of Austin, Texas. Uh, Jose has been with SAP, the large German software company for more than 20 years, where he's served in a variety of roles, including SAP Labs, Office of the Chief Technology Officer in project management, and for the last seven and a half years, as the project manager for the SAP Autism at Work program, one of the world's premier diversity and inclusion programs aimed at employing individuals with autism. By a brief way of background, Jose was the third of six children. He was born in Oakland, California. He spent much of his childhood growing up in Mexico. His father was a very well-respected professor and social entrepreneur who received Mexico's highest honor, highest honor, highest honor, highest honor, the president of Mexico, Mexico for the work that he did. Work that he did Harvard, Harvard. Harvard. Jose earned, Jose his, earned his bachelor's, bachelor's in computer, computer, computer science from Tecnologico Monterey in Mexico and his master's of science in technology communication from Texas State University. He serves on a number of boards and has won numerous awards across the US and abroad for the work that he's done advocating for inclusion and acceptance for people with disability. He and his wife, Dea, are the proud parents of two adult children who are both on the autism spectrum. And in full disclosure, Jose also did an interview for the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Jose, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Absolutely, thank you, David. Thank you, Eric. And, and thanks to everybody who is here because we are all here because there is, there is a mission and, and uh, this, is, um, this is great for me. I feel like I'm talking to a lot of friends that I haven't yet met in person, but um, that we are connected again by purpose. Thanks for having me today. So as David, uh, as David said, um, I, I have been with SAP for 23 years and my, the majority of the years in my career have been spent in, in the area of products, software products whether that is the, the creation of technology or the implementation of technology or the deployment of that technology at our customers. In 2013, SAP announced a global program called Autism at Work. I was sitting at home at the time I was vice president of product management. And I read this, this email coming out of our diversity and inclusion organization and we were going through a, a challenging time as a family because we did not know what was coming after high school for our children. And um, looking at a program like this and, and the announcement that came uh, around autism at SAP was a breath of fresh air for us 
I raised my hand and I asked for um, some time to dedicate to the program as a volunteer. And uh, very quickly, I became a co-lead for the program on a global basis. And what I would like to share with you is a little bit of our journey. We have 20 minutes, but if there's any questions um, after the 20 minutes, please uh, you know, feel free to ask those. And uh, if there's any questions after today's session, I'm sure that David can uh, and, and Eric can connect us, okay? So um, let's start with the, the, the problem statement of unemployment for folks on the autism spectrum. 85% of folks on the spectrum are unemployed, even though 60% have an average to above average cognitive ability. Many of the folks that are unemployed today are underemployed or partially employed. A great deal of the program, of the problem, I'm sorry, in my opinion, is, is related to uh, the standard processes that we run at organizations, corporations, small, large enterprises, where we have a given protocol to bring people into our organization. This, this problem is very well illustrated by this uh, newspaper clip that I got a few years ago, and I cut it and pasted the old fashioned way with scissors. And basically it reads, failure to make eye contact can alienate hiring managers. This, this uh, um, clip was part of the uh, newspaper here in Austin in the advice section or employment section, uh, basically sharing tips on how to get a job. The article went on to say that establishing eye contact builds essential rapport. But eye contact isn't the only must-have. Other interview killers are failure to smile, bad posture, inappropriate clothing, too much fidgeting, a weak handshake, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you that the people that we have brought into SAP would probably not have been able to work at SAP had we utilized this protocol as the way to hire them. I remember very clearly one time when my son, who was 16 years, uh, 17 years of age at the time, wrapping up his high school years, we were trying to get him a job at a supermarket. He had been part of the wrestling team. Um, he was extremely, extremely hardworking young man. Um, and I remember that uh, he had issues at the time I would say deeper issues within the space of interviewing. He went to a supermarket where he was going to be a cashier. I think he was the only kid with a tie. And, you know, we, we practice at home. And I, I, I basically went through the typical questions that you would be asked for a starter job. And I took him to the interview. He came out and he told me that I'm sorry I didn't get the job. And I said, well, let's, we'll try something else. And, and I said, what, what happened during the interview? And he said, well, I was put in front of a table where there were about four people asking questions of me. And uh, he stuttered, okay, and that's another issue that he had with speech. And he told me that then they asked him to look under his chair. And there was a spray bottle of some product that he had to very spontaneously give a sales pitch to them on how to sell it. And I, really, I asked myself, you know, why are they asking him to sell something? Is he going to be packing groceries? Okay. And, and again, this is, these are part of the protocols. He didn't get the job, of course, because he was not able to be as spontaneous as other kids. But, you know, he was an Eagle Scout. And, and, and I knew that he had a lot of great skills. And I wish that I had been there with the, the interview to tell them that, that he could do the job. But regretfully, he did not get that opportunity. And so is the case with so many people on the autism spectrum that have those skills and have those abilities, but regretfully do not have that opportunity to get past even the first interview. For that reason, SAP created the Autism at Work program. This is not what we would consider to be a, a corporate social responsibility entirely program. This is a business transformation program where we take the abilities of individuals on the autism spectrum and utilize them in, in various different functions of the business. This is part of SAP's vision to make the world run better and improve people's lives. And when you look at this vision, it doesn't say anything about software, doesn't say anything about solutions, 
But we know that, that SAP's vision, again, to make the world run better and improve people's lives comes through software, of course, but also comes through activities like this Autism at Work program. Why do we hire folks on the autism spectrum? First and foremost, we need to attract the best talent and talent comes in various different shapes and forms. We know that we innovate because of our differences and not in spite of them. And it is extremely important for us to bring a different perspective to our creative processes. We have more than 300,000 customers across 190 countries. 75% of the world's transactions touch an SAP system. So for us, it's incredibly important to have that level of representation from those customers that we serve inside of our own ranks in the organization, including the neurodiverse, including the autistic perspective. Alan Kay, famous computer scientist, once said that a different perspective is worth 80 IQ points. I'm a firm believer that that is the case. A different perspective is worth 80 IQ points. We want to tap into an, an underutilized source of talent. We've talked to universities that are telling us that more and more young adults on the spectrum went through individualized education plans, went from grade school to high school and from high school to junior college and from junior college, some of them to college. One university told us that they have 600 students on the autism spectrum. Of course, these are universities that have very robust programs. But then, you know, I talked to a couple recently to a couple of universities in California, told me we have 128, and another one that told us they estimate that they have 300 students that are on the autism spectrum. There's a wave of talent that is autistic. If the numbers, if the statistics prevail, as this relate to unemployment at 85%, we're going to have a big problem out there with all these folks coming out of higher education without the opportunity to get a job. We want to capture the special skills of folks on the autism spectrum. Some folks on the spectrum have this incredible memory. In our industry, uh, we, we, we thrive in what we call patterns. So the ability to identify patterns and systems, uh, systems and data is an extremely important skill, in addition to the formal skills that they may have as maybe computer programmers or perhaps you know, data scientists, amongst many other roles. Retention is incredibly important for us. And one of the things that I, I'll be sharing with you in, in, in the next slide is the statistics on the retention, which adds tremendous value to our company. So let me tell you a little bit about Autism at Work program in a nutshell. The, the program currently is deployed in 16 countries, ranging from Argentina to the United States. Um, we currently employ about 200 folks on the spectrum in full and part-time jobs, internships, contracting opportunities, vocational school, and then there are some folks that are self-identified as being on the autism spectrum. Over the life of the program, which started again in 2013, we have provided all in all about 600 opportunities. Those include, of course, the 200 that we have today, plus other folks that came in and spent maybe six months to a year, year and a half with us in those temporary opportunities that are represented by internships and maybe contracting opportunities. We also kicked off two programs, high school uh, opportunity or what we call enterprise exposure opportunities, because one of the biggest issues that we saw amongst the the, the folks that we hired on the autism spectrum is that they did not have an opportunity to have the exposure to the enterprise world when they were in their educational years. So that's why we opened that, that um, possibility of having uh, high school students come and visit SAP and basically getting immersed to a corporate. Those opportunities in the past range from a one day visit to a one semester visit Every, you know, every Friday, once a month, where we have a set of activities. Those were pilot programs, okay? Those pilots came to an end, and there is right now, of course, discussion on how to continue with those. 92% um, retention rate on a global basis, approximately, across, across the world. SAP employs folks in 29 different types of roles. Basically, we have folks represented in every division, we call them board areas are divisions in the company. So every board area is represented by somebody on the autism spectrum. The jobs range from those that are very task-oriented back office all the way to folks that are consultants that are going out to customers being the face of SAP. 
oftentimes we get the question, well, all of this seem to be professional roles. What happens with quote unquote, the other roles, the non-professional roles? Um, what, what I can tell you, our perspective is that we are hiring people into core areas of our business. Uh, these are jobs that are important for us and, and again, represent every division of the company. My hope is that other companies whose core business is not IT and technology uh, will, will do something similar. So if you, are, if you have a bakery or if you have a flower shop, uh, go out and find somebody who is on the autism spectrum. Uh, I think you're going to find a great baker or uh, somebody uh, to help you make flower arrangements. Somebody in the, on the autism spectrum that will be great at that. So again, the invitation out there for anybody who's in the audience is, is to consider what is your core business and try to identify roles and possibilities for somebody, in this case, who is neurodiverse. We provide support via private-public partnership. So we have processes that are modified for sourcing and screening and interviewing folks in the spectrum. We provide uh, training, pre-employment training program uh, here in the United States that um, is approximately six weeks in length. Uh, we have a specialized uh, or an accommodated onboarding process. And lastly, we have a retention process in which we implement what we call a support circle, which includes a job, a job coach, a mentor, a team body, and of course, a manager that have received autism awareness training. We've had an opportunity to share the program with more than 1,700 organizations, ranging from 900 companies, seven universities, all the way to the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the White House, uh, US Congress, Senate of Mexico. But we've also talked to very small high schools in small towns that have expressed interest in learning about this. We'll talk to anybody who is interested in talking to us about neurodiversity and autism in the workplace. We created what is called the Autism at Work Summit, currently in Argentina, Australia, India, New Zealand, and the United States. And we have, uh, we're a founding member of what we call the, what we call the um, Autism uh, uh, Eastern Group, okay, which is in the city of Philadelphia, but also the Round Table, uh, which is consists of about 30 employers who have formal programs to hire individuals that are neurodiverse, in our case, of course, individuals on the autism spectrum. I think that the single people ask us, what is the, what is the biggest impact that the program has had? And I can tell you that it, it ranges a whole lot. Uh, I'll tell you four quick stories that hopefully will bring up that impact uh, to life. On the left side, we have Nico Newman. Nico came to, to SAP through the Autism at Work program. SAP has a, what we call a innovation award. It's called the Hassel Plattner Founders Award. Hassel Plattner was one of the founders of our company. And we have more than a thousand entries every year across 190 countries. Every year, one, one team, typically anywhere between five to 15 people wins that award and they are flown to Germany, where's our headquarters, and they are presented this award by our CEO in front of 10,000 employees, sometimes virtual, sometimes on, on site or a combination of thereof. The sole winner of this award was Nico Newman last year with something that he created um, in the finance and administration department that accelerated the process from three days to about three hours. We have consultants like Gloria Mendoza. Gloria is a computer scientist, but not also is she a, a, a gifted uh, technologist. She's also a gifted opera singer. She has dual majors in music and computer science. And in this picture that you see here, Gloria is singing the national anthem at NFL Monday, Monday Night Football, NFL game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the New York Giants. Patrick Viesti, who had dozens of interviews, um, he was he graduated number one in his class at uh, in a university in communications, and he was regretfully not able to land the job. Uh, he applied to a job at SAP. He's been with us working in project management for uh, six and a half years now. And uh, during his first year, he uh, represented us at the United Nations on World Autism Day. You see him here uh, sharing his testimony 
with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And lastly, we have uh, Mark, Mark Jessen. Mark Jessen came to us. Uh, he is today what we call a catalyst, which is the, the highest level of performance that we have in, in our employees at SAP. Before coming to SAP, uh, SAP uh, Mark, uh, not immediately before, but maybe sometimes recently in his life before, uh, he had experienced homelessness. So uh, Mark is a gifted, um, what we call multi-cloud ops engineer, and uh, he's been with us for um, a little bit over uh, a little bit over three and a half years. These are just a handful of stories. Um, everybody has a story in, in the impact that they've had in our company. Again, ranging from innovation to a change in perspective has been, has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for, for listening in. I'm gonna stop sharing my material here. And if you have any questions that I might be able to support, please let me know. Well, Jose, let me say thank you for that uh, enlightening presentation. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize, these are real jobs that these individuals are competing for. They're not, you know, charity, you know, type of jobs. And it does make a huge impact in the business, not only from the work that they contribute, but the impact that they have on their coworkers, right? To be in a more inclusive and accepting work environment. So I just want to say thank you again for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Eric who's gonna field uh, some questions. So Jose, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Jose. Um, folks uh, in the meeting, please do post any questions you have in the chat box and I will uh, read those questions to Mr. Valesco. Uh, we have a question from uh, past president Marshall Schmidt. Uh, he says, our society has trouble accepting people with special needs. So what is the most important thing that we as individuals, and I'll even add uh, as Rotary, uh, can do to change that? You are already doing it. I mean, the fact that we're having this, this presentation and this discussion, uh, it adds another 35 or 40 people to the level of understanding that needs to be attained in society. And I know that, you know, uh, folks that are listening in today will probably have a conversation with one or two more people. And that's really how it works. So I, I think engagement is probably the single most important first step, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a that's a very good answer. And um, you should know that uh, we're also streaming live on Facebook right now. So we have folks watching us that way. Uh, this recording will be posted on our website. So the the word will uh, will definitely get around and it will certainly multiply. Um, one of the uh, one of the other questions we have from uh, our member Jody Santaford. Hey Jody, um, she's curious how you have adapted your hiring practices and and how do you know when you have an applicant on the the spectrum? Uh, I'm going to start with that question because she's got a second part of that question. We have we have a. Um... Uh, two processes. Uh, one is what we call the pilot process when we're opening up a new location. Another one that is the Main Street process. Let me start with the with the pilot process. When we go out and, and open a new location, we uh, go and talk to the managers. We go and talk to um, the executives in that location. So, for example, when we went to Buenos Aires, Argentina to, to kick off, we had a meeting uh, with about 150 people. And out of there, we were able to identify some managers that have expressed interest in participating in our pilot program. And, and that's how we acquire some of those positions. The next thing that we did is we partnered with a local NGO, nonprofit organization that catered to the needs of folks with disabilities, in this case on the spectrum. And they were able to find a number of candidates for us that we matched against the jobs that we had for the pilot program. And that's really how the program gets off the ground. We do a couple of iterations of that. And then once we reach the level of comfort that we have the processes uh, uh, implemented to our satisfaction in that location, then we go into the mainstream, uh, mainstream mode. In the mainstream mode, we do, again, a pre-employment training program. The question was around how do we identify folks and how do they know that we have a program? Well, there's been a significant amount of, of uh, marketing, I would say, around the program, precisely for people to know that, that we have a different path to success. 
for folks that are on the spectrum. The way that we work in the U.S., because keep in mind that this might be slightly different in every country where we operate, is that if somebody has expressed interest in joining our, our autism, or SAP through the Autism Network Program, they have the ability to contact us and then we put them in touch with our partner, Neurodiversity in the Workplace out of Philadelphia, and they help us with those activities related to, to sourcing and the screening, the initial screening of, of, uh, of the candidates, right? We want to make sure that we are a good match for the candidate. And, and also we have this pre-employment training program that allows us to get to know the individual much, much better than you would in this one hour, half an hour uh, uh, interview. We have a, an extended exposure time of uh, anywhere, depending on the location around the world, between two and six weeks that allows us to get to know the candidate better. Um, there's yet another way in which, in which people have joined SAP. There might be somebody who's on the autism spectrum. They apply for a job in the traditional jobs portal that we have. They might be going through an interview at that point in time they may disclose to our recruiters that they are on the autism spectrum or that they are neurodiverse and that they require some accommodations. At that point in time, the autism work program is pulled in to make the necessary arrangements and to implement a slightly different process than would be the, the typical process that you have. Other people have decided to disclose after they are hired at SAP and they reach out to the autism work program and say, is there anything that you can support me with in the sustainability phase of my employment life here at SAP. So there's a variety of different ways in which, in which people come in and disclose. And of course, we respect everybody's privacy. People can do it at different uh, uh, parts in the process, depending on, on where their appetite for disclosure is. So that I think tells us a, a good summary of how the hiring practices have adapted and kind of how people get uh, perhaps onboarded into the in, into the firm. Uh, the second part of Jody's question is how has the day-to-day -day work culture changed to support these employees? Most of the employees that we have today uh, work in different departments. We are firm believers that in order to change the culture of the company and the DNA, we have to have our colleagues out and about in every function, in every area of, of the business. Um, we have every time that somebody joins a team, we provide autism awareness and sensitivity training to also depending on the, the privacy of the individual. If the individual says it would be great for, for you to train the team, then we provide training for the team. If they say, I only want the manager to know that I'm on the autism spectrum, then we provide that training only for the, for the manager. But we started the program seven years ago. The word autism is no longer a, a, a strange word for somebody at, at SAP. It's part of our language, it's part of the culture. We have kicked off programs on the benefit side that uh, support um, employees who have a family member on the autism spectrum. Just this morning, just this morning, we had a call, a one hour call between uh, Ernie Els, who you may know as a world-class golfer, and the president of SAP. We had more than a couple of hundred people, actually it was significantly more than that, that joined the call. And it was a conversation about autism because we are an autism awareness month. When the president of, of, of SAP America and, and, and somebody like Ernie Els engage in front of hundreds of employees, this tells us that this is an important topic for the company, number one. And number two is a mainstream topic. It's not a surprise topic. This is something that is already part of the company. That's fantastic. So with a program like, like this, um, I, I admit that I have not heard of such programs around in, in various companies. That doesn't mean that they don't exist. So I'm curious. Uh, do you have any sense of how many companies, at least more major companies out there, have programs that are even remotely similar to what you guys are doing at SAP? Absolutely. And very early on, you know, part of the unanticipated mission of the program, that's what I call it, because our core mission was to bring talent to SAP. But an, an unanticipated part of the mission was to share this with other companies. 
it was completely on unexpected for us the number of companies in in civil societies and universities in uh, k-12 educators etc et that et expressed interest in learning more about the processes methods to implement a program like this very early on we uh, started conversations with microsoft with jp morgan chase with ernst and young with four motor company Today, there is something that we call the Employers Roundtable that is basically housed within Disability in a nonprofit organization that caters to the needs of um, potential employers and employees uh, um, that have a disability. And this roundtable, again, counts with the companies that I just mentioned. There is a monthly call. These companies exchange ideas in ways in which we can all benefit from improving our processes to hire and retain individuals on the autism spectrum. So it is becoming uh, mainstream. It's taking a little bit, a little bit of time. But when you have brands like that, you have brands like the Philadelphia Eagles that partner with us as well in in uh, in activities related to um to autism you have companies like vertex software not a very large company with 1500 employees that has a full formal uh, program out there you know that there is a change in the air and that the program is being adopted hopefully this opportunity allows us to amplify that that's that's wonderful. Well, thanks for all that you do for uh, particularly for sharing the word, because uh, frankly, with what you guys have set up, it sounds like it, you guys have a fantastic strategic advantage, frankly, with how you're leveraging the, the different skill sets out there. So I think it's it's very good of you guys to be sharing the word and and trying to get other companies involved. So we, we thank you, Jose, for sharing your your time with us. Today, I think it was very, very valuable. And as a very small token of our appreciation, we want to send you a candle. Uh, we're going to have one of these in the mail very shortly. And we offer these gifts uh, as thanks to our speakers every week with the goal of affecting lasting change in Chicago, as we do with, with everything we do at Rotary One. So all proceeds from these candles support Bright Endeavors and their mission to empower young moms by providing transitional jobs and professional skills training. So that not only helps those moms, but it supports their kids, and then obviously, ultimately, the community. So we've got one of those in the mail to you shortly. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being with you today. The pleasure is ours. Thank you very much. Um, and that's a nice transition into the next part of our program here today. Uh, you have a, a, a special treat. Uh, we have our service spotlight, which we haven't had for a, a little while. But you may recall that one of the key outcomes of our strategic planning process was that our members wanted to know more about the service projects we were doing, projects we were funding, and how we were having an impact in the community. And so we try to do this service spotlight segment from time to time. And uh, the focus today is going to be on our, on our candles and bright endeavors. And so to introduce the segment, I want to pass the floor over to our community service co-chair and board member, Ms. Sarah Buck. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. I am pleased to introduce the company Bright Endeavors. Rotary One chose this business this year for the gifts that we provide for our invited speakers due to its mission and how they serve our Chicago community. Bright Endeavors is a candle producing business that was founded in 2007 and merged with the group New Moms in 2010. They use soy wax in their candles, which is a plant-based renewable resource with a clean burn. Their candles are produced by young mothers and a 12 week program that includes classroom training in addition to production. Bright Endeavors also helps their participants find permanent jobs once their program has ended. Thank you for what you do and for being here to share more information with us. I now turn the mic over to Ali Sundet to talk about their program and show us their video. All right, thanks so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Ali Sundet and I am the Marketing and Engagement Manager at Bright Endeavors. Uh, and so similarly to what we've been talking about 
um, on the call today is really this idea of making workforce our workforce more equitable and really work for everyone. Uh, and so I like to share a video uh, about Bright Endeavor so you can hear directly from the young moms in our program uh, and some of our directors and learn a little bit more about who we are and what we do. And then after the video, I'll share a little bit more. like a needle for a long time like at first one girl didn't open up as much but once she got the feeling of the vibe in the room it's like she opened up like she talking more to everybody else so it's welcoming that's what i like the most is that you can share experiences and you can open up without being judged it's better to be in the program to be at home because i know i had jobs before that i never was on time probably the first couple of days i was on time but i i just feel like every morning i wake up i got something to look forward to they make me want to be on top of stuff. We are here at Bright Endeavors, a social enterprise of new moms located in West Garfield Park in Chicago. Bright Endeavors makes hand-poured artisan soy candles. You can find our candles in Whole Foods. We make private label candles for companies like CB2 and some other uh, well-known home furnishing companies, free of all the baddies that nobody wants to see and the things they put on their bodies or in their homes. And the most important part of the candles, obviously, is that they're hand poured by the young moms in our job training program. So the job training program enters moms who are looking for work, who are pregnant or parenting in the Chicagoland area and they enter into a program experience in which they are not only doing candle making, which is how we use to train and help build job training skills, but also uh, financial capabilities. We talk about parenting. We also do contextualized lessons, and we work with our participants to move them into more permanent job or post-secondary uh, opportunities. Most of our participants, this is their first job, and so they really change and grow in building those job skills that they didn't uh, get to exercise prior to being here at Bright Endeavors. Some of the things that I've learned is controlling your emotions, that you have to be patient. I have a four-year-old, her name's Carmen. I used to not be as patient with her. One of the challenges that I faced during the pandemic was not being able to take my daughter on the bus because like, I didn't want to risk her getting sick. On January 27th, I got my first car and I was able to purchase it all by myself. And I wouldn't be driving it right now if it wasn't for like Musa, one of our coaches pushing me to get my license because I only had my permit. You know, it's a very fulfilling uh, job and knowing that our mission is such that we have the space to be able to support moms in their goals and see the things that they can accomplish within a very short amount of time is really inspiring. Uh, and it's really something that we look forward to coming into work every day. All right, thanks for watching. Um, so again, Bright Endeavors is the 12 week um, transitional job training program for young moms um, in Chicago. And so we're using candle making um, to really partner with moms in their parenting and career journeys. Um, I will say that the pandemic has caused us to be really creative and um, change some of our strategies and uh, you know, think about um, other industries with where we're partnering. Uh, and so we have switched um, our employment partners uh, in the pandemic to include light manufacturing, transportation, and healthcare. Uh, and so really the revenue um, of all of our candle sales um, goes directly into our program to make sure that we can sustain uh, the job training and help grow it. Uh, and we sell our candles, um, you know, like the video mentioned in boutiques across the nation, um, in Whole Foods in the Midwest, and then on our website, brightendeavors.org. Um, so a little plug, we are you know, accepting orders for Mother's Day. And so our deadline for shipping nationwide is May 1st. And then for local, meaning in-state in Illinois is May 3rd. 
to arrive um, by Mother's Day. And a couple other ways um, that you can think about partnering with us, uh, you know, we are beginning to accept volunteers, you know, safely in person. If, if that's something that um, is of interest uh, to you or your organization, you feel comfortable with. Um, and we also um, partner with organizations to do uh, custom corporate gifts. So similar to the Rotary speaker gifts. Um, so I will put our website in the chat um, and I just want to thank you for uh, supporting Bright Endeavors and really partnering with us in our mission um, to really help sustain and grow, you know, our program and programs like ours. So thank you for having me today. The pleasure is ours, Allie. Thank you so much for being with us and for that fantastic video. Uh, you'll see a lot of positive comments in the chat box. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely, uh, uh, if you can also perhaps put your contact information in there. Uh, we already have the website in the chat box uh, because uh, there's a few folks who have expressed some interest in perhaps ordering some candles from you. So uh, thanks for all that you guys do. Uh, we're happy to partner with you guys. And uh, again, I, I think our speakers always enjoy getting this gift. It's, it's, a very, it's, it's always nice to get something that you can use and that reminds you of the uh, of their talk with Rotary every time they, they light it. Very good. Um, so we have uh, several guests with us today. So we're going to do our uh, introduction of guests as we always do. Uh, I ask that you just tell us your name, what you do, and if you are a Rotarian, tell us what club you're with. Uh, so I am going to start with our old friend, Mr. Randy Pote. Hi, all. Uh, Randy Pote, member of the Las Vegas One Rotary Club, and I just, I just love, I love coming to these meetings. Thank you for the invite. Always good to have you, Randy. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. I hope. <laughs> all right, uh, and another uh, old friend, Ade Kunle. Uh, welcome back, Ade Kunle. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you, my Rotterdam president. My name is Adekunle Adebayo, past president of Rotary Club of Ota, District 9110, Nigeria. Uh, it is the presentation is very interesting and it is worth uh, encourage. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Adekunle. Um, and good to, good to see you again. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let's see uh, who else we have as guests on the line with us today. Uh, well, we have uh, Marshall's friend, Mark Nabel. Uh Mark, uh, welcome back and please introduce yourself. Oh, I think you're, you may be on mute, Mark. I'm not sure. I was on mute. I was on there mute. I only had a year and a half to figure out how this works. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate being here. Uh, I am not a Rotary member uh, yet. Uh, I live in Chicago. Uh, I work in renewable energy, and uh, I, uh, I'm not sure what else. Uh, my favorite fruit is mango. I'm not sure uh, what else uh, is expected. I, I highly support mangoes. It is also my favorite fruit, and I have a whole crate of them in the other room. So... Uh, I think that alone qualifies you to become a Rotarian, so I, I do highly encourage that. Wait till you hear my views on vegetables. Be oh, oh, very good, very good. I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be right in line with uh, with uh, Rotary's views on vegetables as well. Very good. Did I miss any guests here with us today? I, I understand that also on Facebook Live, we have visitors from Australia and Portugal watching here with us today. So uh, if you can hear me out there, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. We, we appreciate it. We have uh, quite a few announcements here today, which just means there's lots of very exciting things going on. And uh, let's start with volunteer service. So we had a Rotary reading room. You may recall that the Rotary reading room or the Rotary One reading room is basically a, a virtual opportunity for our members to engage in hands-on service 
by reading books to children generally between four and eight years old. It's been very popular and very effective. And we keep getting invited back for more. So I want to thank you uh, or express my thanks to uh, Marga, Ted, and Michelle Stewart, who did a Rotary Reading Room on April 13th. Thank you very much. Also on April 16th, for a third grade classroom in Robbins, John Alberts and Nick Del Carlo. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, participating in that. We also have another one coming up this afternoon, I believe uh, around 4 p.m. That one's actually a recorded Rotary Reading Room in Spanish. So uh, anybody out there uh, speak Spanish fairly well enough to read a children's book? Uh, raise your hand if, if you do. I think we need one more speaker for that. So please reach out to myself or to Karen uh, or uh, Sarah Buck. Uh, send us a note, send us an email. Uh, we could use uh, another reader for that. Uh, it really doesn't take very long and you have a huge impact. I also want to give a, a big shout out to our new member, Shada Calderwood, and her family who came out yet again for uh, supporting the meals delivery program for seniors on Friday. Uh, I am not in this photo, but I was there as well. And so, Shada, it was good to meet you and your family in person. Uh, please note for folks who enjoy coming out to that program that we're going to press pause on it for two weeks uh, because uh, Chef Alita needs a break, uh, understandably so. So we will be continuing that program on May 7th, and that should be reflected on the calendar. Feel free to go to the calendar and sign up for that. It is so easy. You get a list of, of apartments to go to. You get the meals delivered to you. You literally go just spread some cheer, spread some joy, knock on a door and, and hand over a meal. We also have another opportunity for hands-on service, and this one is virtual. So very easy to do this no matter where you are in the country or where you are in the world. And this is for our Job One program. If you were on at the beginning, you heard me announce how effective our Job One program has been, particularly in attracting students this year. Uh, but it means we need more folks to help out in our training modules. So this Saturday at 9 a.m., we'll be reviewing the first drafts of resumes for these students. So uh, if you can help by reviewing resumes for these students, we'd like you to sign up uh, for this resume review on Saturday morning. It's all virtual. Uh, so if you've got nothing else going on, or even if you do have something else going on, uh, please step up for this. This one's really important uh, for our students and for their futures. Uh, this Saturday, uh, there's another a volunteer opportunity. So this is, this is good. It's a good problem to have. We have a lot of things going on, a lot of ways you can help out, whatever sort of fits into what your priorities are. Uh, are you interested in the environment? Well, then come out for the Earth Day cleanup this Saturday between 10 and 12 at Grant Park. The whole Rotary District will be out there, clubs from across the district, as part of a much broader effort around the entire Great Lakes to clean up around the Great Lakes. And uh, this one, again, pretty easy. You show up, hopefully it'll be a nice day, go to Grant Park, pick up some trash. Uh, you'll be assigned to a particular portion of the park. You can sign up on our website at the calendar uh, or let, uh, let Karen or any of the staff know that you're interested in signing up. Are you more interested in helping out with disease prevention? Well, Sinai Chicago has several pop-up clinics coming up to support the vaccination effort. And what isn't more rotary than supporting vaccines, right? Uh, we have one this Saturday, April 24th. Another one, the following, well, two Saturdays after that on Saturday, May 8th, both from 8 to 12 uh, p.m. and then from 12 to 4 p.m. at St. Agnes Church. Those locations and all of this information is in the Gyrator newsletter. It is also on the calendar. And then we have, uh, we have our own service project, a uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository food drive that, that we're doing. Uh, 
Neetha, I don't want to mean to put you on the spot, but uh, if you're if you're on and available, do you want to give the uh, 20 second overview of what that food drive is all about? And feel free to say no if I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Here. No, that's that's great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, actually, this is in response to the increased demand that we're seeing as a result of the pandemic, a 60 percent increase in, um, unfortunately, for requests for food. Uh, so this is a drive that we started. And if you go to, I think the link is in, okay, we can put the link in the chat. Uh, and basically you'll be able to, it's, uh, you can just indicate how much you wanna donate. We've started the donation through the community services committee, um, starting it with a thousand dollars, but we put a goal out there of 15,000, whatever, whatever we're able to do. One, each dollar provides three meals, which, um, is a wonderful impact if we can have it. And then they also have an option where you could indicate um, like different types of food you want to donate. They have some, make it seem like you're shopping online. It's a virtual drive. You don't need to don't uh, drop anything off or you can just indicate the amount and stuff too. And the link is in the chat. So every bit helps. And um, as Eric mentioned, uh, Chef Alita actually um, is very involved with the, uh, herself donating food, but also working with um, these type of programs. And so we're also helping operationally for these programs too. So thanks to everybody who's shown interest. Thanks very everybody. good. Thank you very much, Nita. And thanks for organizing this. Um, so I wanna share with you a, uh, a video that we, uh, that we had come our way about global health and the impacts of Rotary on a global level. Cause who doesn't like a, uh, a nice little video here. So uh, Cam, if you could queue up uh, that video, uh, it's only about a minute or so. I would like to thank Rotarians for your incredible efforts over the decades to eradicate this devastating disease and to congratulate you most importantly on what you have achieved. Rotarians have a very powerful global voice, and they've demonstrated that time and time again about polio. Your work matters, and we and the world need you. Every idea and action that you have taken has led us to where we are and where we will be going. We are proud of our amazing partnership with Rotary. As we near the finish line, the work is harder than ever and Rotary's support is more important than ever. We cannot succeed without you. We must stay the course. Together, we can make sure the children of the future only learn about polio in history books. It's only because of this big global movement, which had Rotary at the very center, that today we're just at the cusp of eradicating polio. Rotarians, we need you. We really do, to continue to do what you historically have done so well, but to actually tick it up a bit. Rotarians, you are almost there. This is an exciting, close to success moment for all of us in the world. If you look at, at what's made a difference in terms of the progress, um, often political commitment is, has been a factor. And Rotary has been key in terms of motivating community leadership, political leadership, to, to get, you know, to get this job done. So what other organization can you be part of where you actually are responsible for eradicating a disease off the planet, an entire disease? And that's obviously what Rotary has been doing globally with the eradication of polio. So how are we able to achieve that? How are we able to support uh, food drives like Nita talked about? How are we able to support students through our Job One program, which not only uh, provides some uh, subsidies for some of the jobs, but also provides scholarships for those students and a variety of other resources? Well, we do it through our annual campaign, which provides funds for Rotary International and also for our, our own club. And uh, Marga is not here today, but if she were here, she would say every little bit matters. 
Uh, and we want everybody in the club to be able to participate, even if it's at a very small level, $10, $20, whatever uh, you can contribute uh, helps to, to, to really get us to 100% participation, which is, is really the goal here. Uh, I wanna thank everybody who has contributed in one form or another, either through your, uh, your easy pay dues over the, the prior year and the Golden Wheel membership or through direct contributions. Uh, I also wanna to thank our guests. I know uh, many of our guests on today uh, contributed uh, when they joined the meeting. And I do want you to know that we noticed that and we do really appreciate that. That helps to support all the good work that we're doing. So uh, we have a couple of other events coming up uh, beyond just all the great service that we talked about. Uh, there's a great series, part of the Rotary International Discussion Series, uh, also Thursday at noon, this Thursday at noon. It's called, Is Doing Good, Good Enough? Humanitarian Solution Through Collective Actions. And uh, leading that will be John Huco, uh, husband of President-elect Marga Huco, as well as General Secretary and CEO of Rotary International. Uh, but there's a star-studded panel. Uh, it's being moderated by WGN News anchor Lourdes Duarte. Uh, there's the president of the MacArthur Foundation, a professor from Northwestern University and, and founder of Innova Innovations for Poverty Action. And so it'll be a very interesting program. Uh, the link is in the chat box. It's also in the Gyrator newsletter. Our own district conference is coming up June 3rd through the 5th. There's no cost to attend this year. It's super easy. You can pop in and pop out as you want since it will be virtual. And the first 300 to register for the conference uh, get a pretty sweet little swag bag. So uh, you can sign up for that. Again, the link will be in the chat box. It is also in the gyrator. And that's our own conference. Then there's the broader Rotary International Convention. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be in Taipei, and that has been canceled due to the pandemic, uh, similar to the prior year where it was supposed to be in Honolulu. Uh, hopefully uh, in Houston, uh, which will be the following year, uh, we'll be back to uh, an in-person Rotary Convention. But you can still participate virtually June 12th through the 16th. Uh, if you uh, register... Now, I believe there is a discounted rate. That information, again, is in the newsletter. It is also in the chat box if you're interested in participating. There's still all kinds of good stuff there. The House of Friendship, if you've been to a Rotary Convention, you know what I'm talking about. That's a lot of fun. Marga has tipped us off to a great event called Support the Africa Peace Fund and Africa Peace Concert. Uh, for a suggested donation of $50, you get three hours of African colors, beat, and rhythm. That is this Friday, April 23rd, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So please join that exciting event. And then if you're also looking for uh, a little bit of in-person outdoors fun uh, and, and contributing to a good cause, the IMD Guest House, an old friend of uh, Rotary One, we've supported them on projects before, uh, sort of a similar operation to the Ronald McDonald House, if you know what that's all about, of, of housing folks who are, are in the IMD, Illinois Medical District, to see, uh, to see uh, relatives who are in one of the hospitals. They have a golf outing that is a fundraiser. That's on Wednesday, May 19th at Seven Bridges Golf Club in Woodridge. Again, the link will be in the chat box and you can see it in the gyrator. And now for some of our own upcoming meetings here for Rotary One. Our committees meet as always via Zoom. You have the Community Service Committee on May 6th, uh, International Service Committee to be determined in May, and then PR and Marketing Committee on May 20th. You also have our board meeting uh, on the first Tuesday of every month. The next one will be May 4th. Those are always in the calendar and everybody is welcome. If you want to see how the business of the club gets done, I encourage you to uh, sit in. Obviously, with everything happening over Zoom, it makes that a lot easier. 
We also have a uh, variety of great programs coming up for our members and our guests and our friends. Uh, I already mentioned the first five collaborative April 22nd at 11 a.m. I'm going to repeat it because it's such a cool program and you're going to get to, to meet a lot of your cohorts from other large clubs on the West Coast. So that'll be again April 22nd at 11 a.m. A collaborative discussion and joint meeting with the Rotary International President elect. And that very same day in the evening, we have for the first time in a long time an in person evening social event. That's April 22nd at 5 30 p.m. at La Bar. That's 20 East Chestnut Street. So uh, please come out and uh, have a beverage of your choice with your fellow Rotarians. And guests are welcome at that as well. Uh, please do join if you're able. We also continue our Friday afternoon roundtables. Show up at the Union League Club on the fourth floor at uh, 12, 1230 or so. And uh, there'll be a table waiting for you and an opportunity to have some great fellowship with some of your fellow Rotarians. Other meetings coming up. Obviously, we had a fantastic program here today, uh, but we also have a couple of other great programs coming up. Uh, many of you I know are Metra riders. That's our commuter rail system here in Chicago. Well, come here. Jim Derwinski, CEO and Executive Director at Metra, talk a little bit about how they're sorting through the pandemic and all the challenges that they're facing. That's our program next Tuesday, April 27th. And then Tuesday, May 4th, come here from, come here from the mayor herself. Lori Lightfoot will be here. That's an evening meeting at 5.30. I think that will be a, a very enlightening program and probably extremely well attended. Now, we normally at this point have one of our guests read the four-way test. And, uh, and Mark, uh, since you uh, already are near and dear to my heart as a lover of, of mangoes, I see you're still on. Uh, would you do us the pleasure today of reading the four-way test. It's on the screen uh, right here, so you can just uh, read what's on the screen. I am happy to do so. Can you all hear me? Absolutely. Well, that is uh, an improvement from the four. Uh, the four-way test. Um, of the things we think, say, or do, let me my screen just to show it. Things we think, say, or do, one, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much to all of our members and guests for being here with us today. And with that, meeting adjourned.